Hi, Terry Shanefelt for UAB School of Medicine. In part one of this two-part series on how to critically appraise a harm study, I'm going to discuss two of the biases that observational studies are particularly prone to, susceptibility bias and selection bias. When critically appraising a study, there are three steps. One is to determine if the results are valid, two is to determine what the results are, and three is to determine if the results will help you care for your patient. In this video, we're going to focus on, are the results of this harm study valid? Whenever you read a harm study, there are three questions you need to answer as you read through the study. In this video, we're going to focus on this first question. I'm going to shape this video around the nurse's health study, and we'll critically appraise a nurse's health study, which was published some years ago, but was a very important observational study in looking at postmenopausal hormone use and cardiovascular disease. So the first question is if you have a cohort study, you need to know if the groups are similar at the start of the study except for the exposure of interest. So patients in each cohort, and as a reminder, cohort studies, there's an exposed cohort and an unexposed cohort, should be similar for prognostic factors that are known to be associated with the outcome. Remember, in any study, we're trying to isolate the effect of one thing. In this case, that's the exposure on the outcome. So we can't have lots of other things being different. In this case, demographic factors um, that might explain the outcome. And the way you figure this out is you look at table one or the demographics table and see are the two cohorts, the exposed and unexposed, are their demographic factors the same? Commonly you're going to see that they're not. Um, observational studies is just a fact that unless special techniques are used, most of the time there's going to be imbalances in demographic factors. So then if you see this, you need to ask yourself a further questions. One is, are these differences important? Um, do these differences lead to different risks of developing the outcome? And if they do, that's something called susceptibility bias, that one group is more susceptible to the outcome than the other. And that's not how we want things set up. We need the two groups to be set up similarly and have similar susceptibility to the outcome. If you do see these differences and they are important, they need to be dealt with in some way. And dealt with by this point in the study means in the analysis phase. And then finally three, which you always need to ask yourself, is what else is missing? Looking at that table one, are there any other sort of demographic or clinical factors that the authors didn't report on or measure that could be important for the outcome? And we call this residual confounding. So at this point, you may want to watch a couple of my other videos that are related to this. Number one is called Controlling Confounding. I'll go through methods used in the design phase of a study to control for confounding. And then number two, the discussion about residual confounding, which was that last question on the previous slide. Well, let's look at the nurse's health study. I want you to pause the video, look over this table, and compare the um, demographics of women who never used hormones to that of women using estrogen and progesterone, and see what you think. When you've got your answer, restart the video to see how I answered it. So let's see how you did. Well, I think there's big differences in these two groups of women. So are there differences important? You bet. Um, you can see that, in general, hormone users are healthier than non-users. Were these differences adjusted for? Well, they were. So the authors did use multivariable models to compare and or to control for these things that were different between the two groups. Is there residual confounding? Did the authors not measure and control for some other things? And Probably there is, and if you look at my video on residual confounding, I use this as an example, and you can see what I think is not been measured or was missed. Now, if you're dealing with a case control study, you'll have a slightly different question, and that's where do the cases and controls have a similar chance of being exposed in the past to the factor of interest? So both the cases and the controls, and to remind you, cases are people with disease, controls are people who didn't have disease, and in a case control study, we go backwards to try to look for exposures. So cases and controls in a case control study should have equal opportunity of being exposed. Not that they were exposed the same, but they should have equal opportunity of having been exposed. So controls should meet the same inclusion and exclusion criteria as the cases, they should be at risk also of developing the outcome. And what that means is they could have become a case had they had disease. And when I show you an example in a minute, it'll make a little bit more sense. So here's this example. So what do you think about this study? I'm interested in knowing is hormone replacement therapy associated with uterine cancer? Important question. My cases are a group of women with uterine cancer. 
but I choose this controls men without uterine cancer. So they definitely don't have cancer, so that makes them a good control group. But could they have developed the outcome of interest? No, they don't have a uterus. They can never develop an outcome of interest. And they don't have the same opportunity of being exposed to hormone replacement therapy because why would men get hormone replacement therapy? So this would be a bias study, and we call this selection bias. So this concludes part one of how to critically appraise an observational or harm study. Uh, go on to part two now to see the last two questions that you need to answer as you read these types of studies.